Good afternoon, everyone. This must be the graveyard shift when it comes to conferences. Two-day conference last session. So anyway, let's 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 hang in there. Uh, the paper uh, that you have is a paper that I'm revising at the moment, uh, and it was on the politics trap. And I'm not going to mention the politics trap in my presentation uh, this afternoon, but I'd be very appreciative of any feedback on the paper itself. But what I will try to do is to answer the questions, Sarah, that you indicate, uh, that you suggested in relation to polity resilience and polity maintenance. So. A word about uh, the EU polity and its resilience. Uh, firstly, we're dealing with, in historical terms, a very young polity, 50 years more, more or less. And it's gone through several manifestations from coal and steel to communities to community to now union. It's also, uh, as became clear in, in our sessions already, it is as a polity or form of political order, it's much less institutionalized, weak center, more contingent, more conditional, uh, much weaker effective for identity dimension than the kind of political order we carry around in our heads, the, uh, the nation state. And so because of this, its capacity for collective problem solving and its relevance to its member states are constantly at play. It's not a taken for granted polity. And so the EU is tested uh, through crises and levels of contestation increase during crises. Uh, and uh, when I say tested, it's an observation that uh, crises, when, when the EU faces hard policy choices, challenges, crises, there's a tendency to catastrophize it, both in the media, but also among academics. The latest crisis is always existential. So if every crisis is existential to the EU, how is it that it has somehow or other managed to make its, its way through? So what I'm interested in, in in this paper is how the EU avoided the national reflex, how it avoided or overcame the constraining consensus and a, a, avoided a destructive dissensus in relation to two crises, uh, COVID and Ukraine. In other words, how did it manage to forge solutions, albeit uh, within limits and constraints, and how did it amass collective power and deploy collective power? Uh, and when I talk of collective power, I mean the whole and the parts, because one important dimension of the EU as a polity that I don't think we've paid enough attention to uh, over the last, uh, at least today, is the way in which the EU, the way in which the centre, the weak centre, operates with the member states and with the capacity that exists at the member states. So when I talk of collective power, I'm talking about the whole uh, and the parts. And then a word on uh, collective power. So um, the definition comes from Parsons. He talks of power to, and for him, it's very much power to get things done. In other words, the power to mobilize the factors and resources of effectiveness. But power to also relies on power with, which is how the EU manages to organize the, the whole and the parts, how they organize together, how it finds common ground among very diverse interests. And so again, the power width comes very much from uh, the pragmatic tradition, but also feminist theory. And then finally, another dimension of power, discursive power, how the EU, how it collectively frames problems and generates a problem frame, and then how that problem frame leads to an action frame. So that's broadly the uh, the analytical framework is how how there is problem recognition and what how the problem itself is framed, and then uh, how solutions are proposed. And collective framing is particularly important in a polity. That, that has high levels of divergence and different perspectives on, on, on lots of on the problems that are faced. 
And why is collective framing important? Because it, it helps mobilize consensus prior to collective action, but also orients and sustains collective action. So for me, the way in which uh, the EU exercises collective power depends in an initial fra uh, collective framing, a capacity to agree, is there a problem and what is that problem? And then two other dimensions, uh, an actor-led mobilization of resources, be, be they institutions and also poli the poli uh, policy toolkit. And then for me, at the end of this paper, I conclude that the EU is developing three polity norms. First, the responsibility to act. Secondly, unity. And thirdly, solidarity. And none of those are obviously complete, uh, but that defining what the crisis is about le leads to appropriate strategies for its solution. And then I look at the... Uh, the crises, and I'll take you through using that. So I don't know how Ukraine made its way into this uh, into this uh, PowerPoint, but let's begin with the pandemic. <laughs> let's begin with the pandemic. Uh, so, what do we? How did the EU respond to the pandemic? Firstly, I think we shouldn't assume that it responded with an understanding that this was a symmetrical shock at the beginning. Because it wasn't. There was a real struggle in the early period of the pandemic to arrive at a collective framing, to agree what the EU might do. Uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty about the disease, the rapidity of the spread, the borders. And there was every member state was in search of PPE, medical supplies, and did they have enough hospital beds? <laughs> So I think the, we're, the assumption that I've heard a lot of around this table, that this was a symmetrical shock from the beginning, was simply is, is simply not borne out by uh, the empirical evidence. And so what we see is the mobilization of the institutions, firstly, the technical institutions and then the political institutions. So beginning with the technical institutions, by ja the end of January, the Council, the Croatian Council Presidency activated something called the EU Political Crisis Response Mechanism, in other, and, but only in information sharing mode. So just sharing what's happening in the different member states. Then on the very same day, the Commission activated its crisis response mechanism. And what really mattered for the way in which the EU management of this crisis uh, evolved was, and this was uh, Stefano's point about the developmental phases through which crises go, was there was a place in the Commission responsible for health. There was a DG Sante. And that DG had started, it was very weak, but it had gradually, it started and was part of consumers, uh, consumer affairs, but then gradually it um, it got its own standing. <clears throat> and it convened something called the Health Security Committee in conjunction with the European Centre for Disease Control. So you had a, an EU agency responsible for disease control, and then you had something called the Health Security Committee, which was binding the member states' health ministries into the EU into the EU ecology. And that, that group met 10 times in five weeks. And they were basically looking at the numbers, looking at the problems uh, and trying to see how could, how could the EU respond to this? So the technical work that was done in that early phase of the crisis was why this was translated from a national reflex into a into a common reflex. And that's part of policy, polity maintenance and polity resilience. Then it required political engagement because at the beginning there was very little political engagement collectively. And the worst uh, time for EU response was on the 5th of March where Italy for the first time ever asked for help uh, and not a single member state responded. This has never happened before in the history of the EU, that at a member state demanding help, asking for help, there was radio silence over that weekend, which shocked the system 
uh, into action. Uh, and Charles Michel, he has been a rather ineffective European Council president, but he was really effective in March 2020. He, he probably did his best work in those four weeks. So what did he do? He decided that he had to get the heads of government together and that the heads of government needed to engage collectively with the problem, both on the health dimension and the economic dimension. And the first two meetings, there were simply conclusions of the council president. The member states were unwilling to say what they wanted to do. But by the 26th of March, uh, the heads of government had actually just had said, this: these are the tracks, the work, work programs, and I tasked the commission to do this, we tasked the Eurogroup to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So the mothership or the command ship was in charge. But in the lead up to the 26th of March, there was a letter from 10 heads of state and government. And this was really important politically because uh, it involved large and small states and not the usual suspects. So it, uh, France and Italy, but then also Ireland, Slovenia. So it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just a group of Mediterranean states, but it was a, a, a geographical mixture. And the language used in that letter, this was the first time when it said, in fact, that this was a symmetric shock to the whole of Europe. Uh, but the demand for bold decisions and that there had to be an effective and united Europeans, uh, European response. So all of that, by the end of March, there was, as I said, those two tracks of work where the collective capacity of the EU was being built. But also those institutions in the EU that had an independent mandate did act very decisively within their own mandate. The ECB didn't take three years to, to begin uh, a bond procurement program. They did it in three weeks. And, and that was a direct learning from the inability to bring the acute phase of the Eurozone crisis under control. And then the Commission came up with the SURE programme. But underneath all of this, at least eight council formations were active on, uh, on, 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 on uh, the virus. Education, internal security, it didn't matter, but there was a, a transversal dimension right across the system. So that allowed for the development of a policy response. And then there were quite a number of uh, policy responses that were, in a sense, going beyond uh, the existing a key. <clears throat> and those were, and I don't, I don't intend to go through it, there was the RRF, which was unprecedented, uh, was breaking a taboo. And of course, the switch country there was, was Germany, which by May had conceded. Uh, that um, that there should be a one-off common debt issuance. Uh, then there was joint procurement of vaccines, and this was a major development, the fact that the Commission was dealing directly with the big pharma companies and that the large countries couldn't buy up the supply, but there was equality across all member states, including the small, which would have had much weaker uh, procurement capacity, were, were getting uh, access to the virus or to the vaccine, sorry. Uh, and so that again was a, a use of the, of the leveraging the collective of the EU to, um, to uh, enhance the uh, pandemic response. And then finally, it has left a legacy. The European uh, Medicines Agency has already been, its, its mandate has been strengthened. Uh, the Disease Prevention and Control Agency has been strengthened. And there's now a discussion of a European health union. So in an area, and this goes back to the competence question, EU competence in health was very weak in treaty terms, but it didn't matter because there was uh, an agreement across the member states that they would collectively respond. There was sufficient unity, this responsibility to act, and also a sense of solidarity and a shock at the fact that there was no solidarity with Italy, 
at the uh, in the initial phase. So certainly, policy uh, evidence of policy resi resilience in relation to the pandemic, and it came through both the normative frame, but also the leveraging of institutional capacity and resources through the policy uh, toolkit. On to Ukraine, and Ukraine is is a much simpler story because uh, there wasn't a struggle about framing the war in Ukraine. It was seen as Chef Zaka from the outset. The European Council met on the evening of the invasion, uh, and this was followed by the Versailles Declaration of March. So within three weeks, the EU had collectively framed um, the Ukraine crisis. And it was very much... Uh, a response to the fact that for the first time uh, in the post-war era that an invasion in Europe was uh, had the aim of changing borders, which was something that was uh, previously taboo. And there was very much, uh, the EU was prepared to, at the early stages at least, to do whatever it takes. So in terms then of the action frame, uh, unprecedented, Unprecedented sanctions, we can discuss whether or not they're effective, but the EU is now uh, discussing its 12th sanctions package. And it was the speed with which the sanctions were imposed. The Commission had done all of the homework and working very uh, closely both with the US and with the UK. The European Peace Facility, which was intended to fund uh, actions in Africa suddenly was being, uh, it, not only were the resources significantly increased, but was being used to purchase lethal weapons for the first time ever uh, in the history of the EU. Uh, the EU Security and Military Committee is the uh, EU vehicle for uh, responding to the weapons needs of Ukraine, not NATO. They, NATO prefer this to be channeled through the EU rather than NATO, and of course the temporary protective directorate for, direct for the first time ever, which gave Ukrainians access to much higher levels of protection than other uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, and finally, the enlargement agenda, putting enlargement back on the EU, uh, back on the EU agenda. So these two crises, uh, the EU did not suffer from uh, either a politics trap or an inability to address the uh, to uh, address the crisis. They were cap the EU was capable of uh, collective action and the exercise of collective power, but there are limits, and. Why did I have? Oh, this was the policy maintenance. I answered your question. Um, so in terms of policy maintenance through these two crises, there was evidence of deeper integration and uh, an enhancement of the toolkit. There was evidence in Brexit of the management of disintegration and the early period of the pandemic. And then differentiated integration comes back on the agenda whenever enlargement is discussed. But I will make one hard prediction now, and that is DI is always used in the discourse on enlargement, but it actually never survives uh, <laughs> encountering with the reality of enlargement because no candidate country wants to join as a differentiated member state. So I think, again, we'll hear a lot about it, but if, if there is an enlargement, it will be the only differentiation will be time, but not time and the euro, but, but nothing else. So then on to the limits of collective power and collective action in the EU. The EU is fragile and vulnerable, and we're seeing the playing out of one of the major vulnerabilities at the moment, and that's the crisis I spoke about this morning. In other words, the Orban problem. Uh, Orban is determined to undermine the EU's response to Ukraine in a very serious way. He is, in my view, in breach of his treaty commitment to sincere cooperation with the other member states and the fact that as a member state, one should not undertake actions that undermine the EU as a whole. And that's he clearly is doing this. And of course, it also highlights the limits of unity that he's using uh, 
he's using Ukraine uh, either to blackmail the EU into giving him how many billions, what's the price tag, or uh, he really wants uh, to undermine the system uh, in terms of uh, because of his relationship with Putin and Russia. So that's a huge vulnerability of a member state within the EU uh, that's behaving in ways that are very damaging systemically to the union. Then solidarity can crack very easily in this fragile system. We've already, um, the responses in a number of East, East Central European countries to Ukrainian grain, Ukrainian trucks, and also across the EU to the temporary protective directive. So solidarity again is conditional and contingent and can break. And then finally, there's how this system, and again, we have touched from time to time over the morning on geopolitics, but the EU is living in a very different geopolitical environment than it has in the past. It was the very early parts of its existence to 89. It was within the protective framework of, of the US and NATO. Um, Post-89, the EU became extraordinarily, extraordinarily complacent about defence and security. Uh, and now it's faced with a hardening of geopolitics uh, globally, how it positions itself vis-a-vis -vis China and the US, in other words, where its agency is, and how it handles uh, Russia, a disruptor state on its borders, and not just a, a disruptive state on its borders, but within its borders. And so again, uh, how this, how the EU manages uh, the fragilities that arrive both intern from uh, dy internal dynamics, but also that hardening of geopolitics. And the EU really struggles to handle geopolitics, as we know, and we just see in relation to the uh, war in the Gaza, Israel war, Qatar has much more influence on the outcomes at the moment than the entire EU. The EU is simply not a player, yet it paid for everything. And when when and if the war ends and re reconstruction is needed, the Europeans will be looked at to pay again. But in terms of influence over the actors in that conflict, bordering on, on Europe, I would say it's Really, really, I, I wouldn't even say that in terms of US and Qatar, I'd say EU is running at about 10% of the influence, which again is, is extraordinary given the proximity of that part of the world and also the impact of instability in the Middle East on Europe. So I'll leave it at that.